pieces. I don't want to waste a minute of time. We're going to start in three minutes, but you got to have three minutes to get back in your chair, finish your conversation. And we're going to have a little bit of time for questions. So if you have a question, you line up at microphone number one. And he's only going to take questions for a few minutes. So the first one to get to microphone number one is the first one to get asked a question. But if you're not listening, you won't know I just said that. So <laughs> if you have a question, get the microphone number one. And he's going to call on several people in a row. We're only using the microphone number one for questions. And we're going to start in two minutes. We're going to get started now. Please take your seats. I see someone at microphone number one, right? Anybody else has a question for uh, Derek? Please line up at microphone number one only. And he's going to take a couple questions. And I know you're just not going to stop talking until he starts. So <laughs> when he starts talking, please be in order. Awesome. So we're just going to take a few minutes for some questions. And again, I'm going to do my best to respond as best as I can. Um, and uh, so, yeah, here we go. Allie Bartlett, Hope Hopewell United Methodist Church. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about how to be available, but also maintain personal boundaries. Fantastic. Thank you, friend. How to be available, but also maintaining personal boundaries. Um, I would say... Saying things to young adults like, we're here for you, let us know if you need anything, and allowing them to come to you on their terms. But what that's going to mean is that when they do come to you, you've got to be ready to respond. I would also say that it's important then to ask questions. So for instance, when any of my students, um, we have a really... Um, deep conversation, at the end of it, if I think a hug is appropriate, I will ask them if they would like a hug. I never assume. And so I think maybe the best way to sort of start figuring out what the boundaries are is to ask questions before you move, before you act. But again, at the bottom of it, I would say that it's got to be on their terms. And that may be a power shift for some of us, but I think it's a place of humility 
And it also creates a lot of safety. I would also encourage you, um, if you're going to do coffee, do coffee in public spaces. If you're gonna do meals, do meals in public spaces. Um, you shouldn't be the only one that knows you're having this meeting with a young adult, things like that. Um, I think it is possible to present yourself as available and also to respect boundaries. Next question. Uh, Pastor Dan of Summit Hill and Coaldale United Methodist. Um, when discussing outreach uh, for young adults with our, my congregations, I often tell them, uh, I think sometimes young adults are a little intimidated by church people and by churches in general. Um, but I think the truth is a lot of times the older people are intimidated by the youth as well. Yeah. Um, so when you're in that public arena, when you're out and, and you see those young adults, what is that initial? Could you provide some insight on on how to begin that dialogue with young adults? Yeah, um, so let's start with the young adults in your sphere of influence. Um, the, your, your children, grandchildren, nieces, nephews. I think a really good question to ask them is, what do you think about church? And just let them give you whatever answer they give. Don't edit it, don't correct it, just take it in. And after they've answered that question, say thank you. And ask if you could ask more questions at another time. Simply asking the question of what they think, what they think of us, what they think of all of this, is a really good way to sort of start that conversation. Another group of people that you might want to consider is if your church is close to a restaurant or even a bar or some other place where young adults are working, I wonder if you're, for instance, at the restaurant tipping well. Because if you're tipping well, here's what you say to that young adult. We, we know it's hard. And we want, to, we, we want to pay it forward a little bit here. We want to make sure that um, you actually get something out of serving us today. And again, that changes the power dynamic. But so little known fact, some people know this, some people don't. Um, I work part time at a craft brewery in Jacksonville as well. So I'm a full time campus minister and I pour beer part time. And that's a whole thing. And I'm going to go really quickly with the story. So I get to. Uh, I get this really great opportunity to stand behind the bar and watch Jesus people interact not knowing who I am. And sometimes it's cool and sometimes it's not cool. But when, when people who um, are wearing the t-shirts, wearing the cross, when they tip me and my coworkers, it means everything to us. And it actually, for those who are consistent in coming to our space, it actually opens the door for more conversations. So I invite you to think about the businesses that are right around your congregations or the businesses that are right around your, um, your residents. And how might you be a blessing to those young adults? Maybe it's not tipping. Maybe it is listening to them and trying to fill a need, asking if it would be okay if you filled that need. These are steps that I believe give you an opportunity to build a relationship that then may be used by Jesus to bring them closer to him. I think the biggest thing that you want to think about um, as you are engaging young adults is that it's got to be relationship first and relationship with no agenda. If the only reason you're reaching out to them is because you've got a youth director position you've got to fill, they will sniff that out real quick. But if you are really wanting to be a friend to these young adults, that actually will be the pathway that they will possibly come to Jesus. It is long work. It is about a friendship over time. You will have to be consistent. You will have to be present. It'll need to be on their own terms, but that becomes a pathway for beginning those relationships. 
Again, I'm going to do my best to respond as best as I can um, to your questions, and I hope it's helpful. Yes, friend. So I know it's contextual and relational, but if you had or you were to consult with a local church that, say, wanted to put $5,000 or $10,000 or $20,000, because you said we've got to put our money where our mouth is. Mm -hmm. So let's say we allocate that. What would you say is the best way to use that money? How do you get started? Or what's the best strategy for building those connections, relationships? I mean, is it automatically hiring a staff person? Or what would you suggest? Yeah. I said 5,000. <laughs> Well, I might have more than 10 at my church, but most churches don't. So. I, I, I do hope if you're going to hire, it's a little more than 10 or a lot more than 10. Um, so thank you for that question, my friend. Um, a couple of thoughts. Um, I would definitely need to know, if I was to consult with your church, I'd need to know who's in your congregation. And if there are some young adults, even somewhat close to your congregation, what would it be like if you said to the young adult, We've got $10,000 to bless this community, and you're in charge. And you did all the interference you need to do with all the folks that are going to be like, what are they using the $10,000 for? And you walked with them, you guided them, but you let them decide what to use us for. Here's what that would say that you are willing to trust a young adult with meaningful ministry and with real dollars. Encouraging a young adult reverberates through their, through their social networks, through their, when they post on Facebook, this church is letting me do this, their friends stand and take notice. So that would be one thing, that how could you entrust a young adult with that? If there weren't young adults in, in your sphere of influence, if there weren't any in your congregation, what is the closest ministry to you that is related to young adults? So for me, I'm in campus ministry, and um, my district superintendent goes to our local churches, uh, particularly those who say they have no young people, and my district superintendent looks them in the face and says, oh no, but you do. Because we're United Methodists, we're connected. You have a young adult ministry. It's the campus ministry. So support your young adult ministry. Because sometimes, friends, it's not really so much about young adults coming to our church as much as it's young adults coming to our church. Does that make sense? And so how might you take that money and seed, help a ministry that you're close to um, continue their work with young adults? And I'll tell you this, the congregations that do that in my district, I'm just, it's anecdotal, it may not always work this way, but in my district, the congregations that invest in our campus ministry the most tend to be the ones that have fewer young adults in their building, and those are the, the pastors and the leaders that my young adults gravitate towards. They don't have to fight for time. They know that those pastors are ready for them, and they know it because those churches are investing in our campus ministry. So that would be another option there. If you are able to um, you, maybe to use some of those dollars for training, to bring people in, to take um, your church members, your leaders to conferences, to places where they are the oldest people in the room and they can learn from some of the young adults, I think that would be a good use of the funds as well. But I think at the end of the day, the question really does come down to um, really being willing to try some things and to make an investment and to know that um, this is what I believe in Jesus, that if we put our faith out there, particularly as it relates to our money, Jesus will meet us. I think it's more about the faith in Jesus to help us reach the next generation than a very specific thing that we might do. I do believe that if we're asking Jesus to lead us and we're saying, Jesus, hey, we've got this, this amount of money, we'd love to use it to reach the next generation, I really believe Jesus will help help us do that. Does that make sense? Yes. Mine is not so much a question but a comment. Um, I've been working with young people forever. 
<laughs> Thank you. Um, started out with 10 young men that were supposed to be for three months. It's now been nine years, and they're still in my life. Yeah. I just want to commend you, and I hope people are really listening to what you're saying. There are so many things that you said that I resonate with. One, I feed them all the time. They eat all the time. Yeah. Okay? Anything I want to get done, I feed them. Growing humans, man. Right. The coffee, the tea, and all of those other kinds of things. But the authenticity of you as an individual, and you use the word that they snuff it out. Mm. They know in a minute whether or not you are real or not real. Wow. The other thing is, is that I have learned so much from them from them. Yeah. And yes, I have the wisdom, I have the experience, I have the life lessons, Come on. I have all of that, but they also have a lot, and they have taught me a lot. Amen. And I said to the young lady just the other day, I mean, waiting to talk to you, but there were so many people, and I'll be very quick, I love talk radio. And I love hearing people, oh, podcast this, podcast that. I'm like, what the heck is a podcast? <laughs> so I call them my boys. They're all 19, 20, and 21, and they know they'll be my boys forever. Mm. I said, can you show me how to do a podcast? Oh, Mr. Lenore, just give me your phone. <laughs> so I gave him my phone. He said, do you know how to go to the Google store? I said, yeah, I understand that. He said, well, then download the podcast and then get what you want. I said, oh, that was that easy. But I have learned so much from them. So it's a reciprocal relationship. Yeah. And I'll close with, I said to one of my boys the other day, oh, my goodness. I said, it started out for three months. It's now nine years. He said, Miss Lenore, we'll be with you for the rest of your life. Mm. And so I thank you for what you are doing, the messages that you said. There, there's no script for it. Yes, you can have training and all those other things, but they know authenticity mm. and they are hungry. They are hungry for those of us in the church not yeah. to preach to them, but to show them what it means to be like Christ and Amen. be Christ-like and have Christ in your heart. Oh, so thank you thank so, you. so very much. Thank you thank so you. much. Thank that you. was awesome. Is there one more question? Actually, I think, yeah. yeah. Well, this will be the last question for sake of time. Hi, thanks. Um, <clears throat> So I run a young adult group at my church and uh, recently have been receiving messages from young adults who come to me with their wounds from the church. Yeah. And uh, especially related to matters of sexuality. And yeah. so I'm looking for some advice as to how I can minister to them, to love them in such a way that hears their pain and uh, also who their pain is directed at and where it comes from. Yeah. Um, and I resonate with that. Most of the people that I meet in my brewery uh, that I work at are people who have a history with church um, and have some, for some reason, usually related to pain, left the church. So I know what I feel called to do, and I hope this will be helpful. I feel called to be a representative of the church and to therefore receive their pain to absorb it and to say, on behalf of the church, I'm sorry. And again, my questions are usually related to tell me more, you know, give me, you know, paint me a, a deeper picture. I don't edit their story. I don't even do a lot of trying to like, well, you know, sometimes we church people get it wrong and we don't mean to, no, I just, I just receive it. 
And I guess that's the place where I start, because I think that's the place where the healing begins when, and you'll hear me say this in a, in a minute, where we validate and we honor people's pain, particularly the pain of young adults. And we don't ask them to get over it really quickly. We just allow them, yeah, let me be the target. And so what, that ends, up, what ends up happening is, um, because I'm receiving and I'm open, they then start telling me stuff that have nothing to do with church. They start telling me about family and not knowing what they're doing with their life. But it's, I, I, for me, it just starts at this place where I'm like, yep, I represent the church. I do. I, I work for the church. I work for the Florida Conference. That's the, yes. And so whatever we did, I will sit here as long as I need to and just, yeah, give it to me. And so I think that's a place where we start and we see where it goes from there. I think also I would just add that it is, there's certain roles that we can play as members of the church and representatives of the church, but we also have to be aware of the things we can't do. And so one of the things that I say in my campus ministry and at the brewery as well is counseling's amazing. Everybody should see a counselor. If you're doing great, I think you should see a counselor at least every two months. And if you're not doing great, then bring it in a little bit. Um, and, and I see a counselor because I do a lot of stuff and I'm you know, living a lot of life. And, and so I can be a great friend and I can be a great representative of the church, but let me introduce you to uh, this counseling friend, this therapist, this psychologist that can help with some of the deeper stuff that I just don't have the capacity or expertise. And I think it's that holistic approach that yes, they need the church and they need care and they need community and not being afraid of engaging that conversation and simply saying, as a member of the church, I'm gonna walk with you on this journey, um, but your pain's real and I can't even fix it. But man, I can listen and I can apologize. Hope Thank that was you. okay. Yep. Yeah. Awesome. So, Lindsay, if we could put the slides back up, that would be great. This is my information um, if you want to reach out. Um, that's my email address, Derek at campustocity.org. I'm sorry that the, the words are probably a little too small. I apologize for that. Um, Derek, D E R R I C K, at C A M P U S T O C I T Y dot org. And I'm on the social medias, Facebook and Twitter, at DLaRuth3. LaRuth is my middle name. And uh, Instagram, I have an alias that I use, and it's just funny. There's no deep meaning behind it. I just have an alias, at Mark Vern. Doesn't have to mean anything. Just is what it is. Um, and if you want to learn more about our campus ministry, uh, campustocity.org um, is a site. This is actually a picture of... Um, many of our students who went on our spring retreat uh, this past semester. And uh, there's a story in every single one of these people. And um, because of time, I can't tell all those stories, so I won't. Um, I'll just keep going. And I'll be hanging out for a few minutes if you didn't get all of this information. Um, Want to chat a little bit more. Um, I'll try to respond to your questions as best as I can. Um, you good for one more story before we close? Very quickly, very quickly. What they need from us. I'm just going to go right through this. First, sorry, 2 Timothy chapter 1. This is Paul speaking to his um, young protege, Timothy. Hear these words. I'm grateful to God, whom I serve with a good conscience as my ancestors did. I constantly remember you in my prayers day and night. Some practical things you can do for young adults, friends. Pray for them. In our campus ministry, we have uh, this saying that we want to mention the names of our students before God because we might be the only ones mentioning their name before God. For many of our students, there is no one else saying their name to God. And so we want to be the people that stand in the gap and pray for them. 
We are Wesleyan Christians. We believe in prayer, amen? It is the greatest thing you could do. Pray for them by name. I hope that young adult you've been thinking about today, that you're not just thinking about them, but that you would pray for them. Here is a prayer that I use, and I'll leave this up for a few minutes. It comes from Ephesians 3. When I don't know what to pray for my students, I'll pray this, and I'm going to pray this for real right now. Oh God, give Jason the riches of your glory. Strengthen him by the power of your Holy Spirit through Jesus Christ dwelling in his heart so that he will know the fullness of your love. I pray this prayer when I don't know what else to pray for my students. You can take scripture, insert their name, and lift them up before God. If there's anything you could do, this is why everybody can get in on this, regardless of how old you are, how much you know, you can be praying for them by name. Second Timothy 1.4, when I remember your tears, I long to see you so that I can be filled with happiness. Friends, we can pray for them, and we can take their pain seriously. Way too many times I've been in conversations with older adults when we talk about millennials or Gen Z, and they're like, they just don't know how easy they've got it. Oh, I, in my day, we weren't able to, I get it, okay? And I'm moving fast here for sake of time, but friends, we, we've just gotta take their pain seriously. We, we, we have to stop this idea that they, you know, we're older, so we've actually been through more than them, and they don't know what they're crying about. Like, it's hard being a young adult in the 21st century. And I would say that they've got more against them than any of us ever did. They've got more that will send them down a rough road than any of us ever did. And so how can we take their pain, their tears seriously? Paul says, I remember your tears. Paul does not say, buck up, buddy. I remember your tears. Take their pain seriously. I'm reminded of your authentic faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice. I'm sure that this faith is also inside you. Because of this, I'm reminding you to revive God's gift that is in you through the laying on of my hands. Other translations say, stir up the gift that's inside of you. Affirm their gifts. We can look at them and we can affirm the gifts that we see in them. Friends, they don't get enough affirmation. I know some of you think they get too much affirmation, but I'm here to tell you they are desperate to be affirmed. And affirmed for the good things they do. Affirmed for the gifts and the talents that they have. Affirm their gifts. Say it to them. And if you haven't said it in a couple of days or a couple of years, say it again. Continuing on, God didn't give us a spirit that is timid, but one that is powerful, loving, and self-controlled. Speak to their fear. Speak to the things they're afraid of. Use your experience and your wisdom to help them understand that, yes, it's hard right now, but it won't always be. It's really difficult to manage your bank account now, but there'll be a day that it'll get easier. It is difficult to understand relationships and career, but one day you'll find your stride. Speak to their fear. Don't ignore their fear. Don't dismiss their fear. Speak to their fear. And I know I just went fast. Um, y'all got some voting that y'all need to get to. So I'm going to end with this scripture and pray for us. This scripture is my favorite scripture in the, all of the New Testament. The whole of creation waits breathless with anticipation for the revelation of God's sons and daughters. And so hear me, Eastern Pennsylvania Conference. The next generation is waiting on you. The next generation is waiting on you to take your place, waiting on you to see them, waiting on you to go after them, 
waiting on you to sit with them and help them discern their call. They're waiting on you, yes, to pray for them and to take this pain seriously, to affirm their gifts and to, yes, speak to their fear. The whole generation is waiting on us, church, to be the people that God has asked us to be. Let's pray together. Holy Spirit, I'm just trusting that some of the stuff that I've said today would be used by you so that we can be who we need to be for the sake of the world in general, for the transformation of the world, but also for the next generation. So would you give us, Holy Spirit, courage? Would you give us energy? Would you give us ideas? Would you break down the walls that divide us and that keep us in? And would you send us out being willing to be used by you to represent Jesus to the next generation? And for those young adults that have been in our heads all morning, would you give us a special word that we could take to them to let them know that they are loved by you? Jesus, thanks for all that you're doing for us and the ways that you empower us to be your church in this world. We give you praise and thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, it was great to be with you this morning. Thank you so much for your attention. Thanks be to God. What a prophet among us, no question.